This is an audio course. Thank you for listening. You said that recently you saw that 58% of employees reported an inability to regulate their attention at work. Tell us, how did you conduct this research and, and when did it happen and what's the story? We have around 600 global companies we work with and we do a lot of research on their employees and their leaders. This specific study, we were out and using technology with the phone to basically measure where is their mind at random points during the day. And what people then have to say is, oh, I was on task, I was off task. And what we see is just that most of the time, we're just not on task. As you said, it's it's more than half of our time. We're really not paying attention to what we're doing, whether we're in a meeting or reading a, a report or trying to do an email. We're not there. So we say on task. I think sometimes the task at hand is resting. Like I am deliberately daydreaming, taking a walk around the block, you know, getting a cup of coffee. How do we count for that? Right. That's a good question. If, as you said, you're deliberate about letting your mind wander, then you're on task. If you're going for a walk and you are actually present with going for a walk, you're on task. If you're going for a walk, wanting to go for a walk and just rest, and you just can't help ruminating over the latest, uh, let's say, plummeting stock market news, then you're off task. All right. Does that make sense? Uh, very clear. Well, so then th that 58%, so the majority of us are off task the majority of the time. Is that fair to say? Unfortunately, yes. All right. So what do we do about it? What do you recommend? Here we are. What should we do? Yeah, I think there are a few things that we need to do. First of all, we need to we need to learn to manage our mind. If we can't manage our mind, we really can't manage where it's spending its time. We can't take a walk when we're taking a walk and we can't be focused on a meeting when we need to be focused on a meeting. So that's the first thing. And that is obviously done by mindfulness training, because that is the training of basically rewiring our brain to be present with what we do. So that is the first and most fundamental step in general, and especially in a crisis. Secondly, we need to look at, like carefully look at how we're living our lives. Like, do we need to check the phone when we get up in the morning? Do we need to bring our technology into meeting rooms? Do we need to have all of our notifications turned on at our phone and our computers? So do everything we can to be able to be more present with what we're doing. I'll tell you what, Rasmus, I have been up and down in my mindfulness practices. I find it really is genuinely beneficial. And I see good things on the day of and the weeks that follow, you know, when I'm consistent with it. It is just amazing how much I don't want to do. <laughs> it is just striking. And uh, just yesterday, I was trying to talk myself into it again. And I was like, you know, Pete, in a way, that's one of the benefits is to get good at doing things you don't want to do or starting them is massively valuable. And so here I am trying to talk myself into it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you do it for me. Can you lay it on us? Some of the most just hard hitting, quantifiable, mind blowing benefits that professionals who want to be awesome at their job should know about to help them get through their resistance to doing mindfulness practice. Yeah. I think the first one, as you also alluded to, like knowing what are we getting out of it? Because having that carrot is helpful and the quantifiable benefits. I mean, there are way too many for me to mention them all now, but I'll just riff off a few. You will have better sleep quality. You will have more happiness. You'll have better work-life balance. You'll be more focused. You'll be more effective. You'll be more prioritized. And then there's all kinds of physiological things like your heart rate will be more healthy, your skin will be more healthy, your eyesight will be better. And I could just keep on going. The most striking and, and fascinating thing I think is that what researchers have found that if we are doing mindfulness practice 10 minutes a day for eight weeks in a row, they can actually measure that a part of your brain called the prefrontal cortex, which is just behind your forehead, is actually growing thicker. So it is exactly the same as going to the gym and training your muscles. That's what's happening in mindfulness training. And then you might wonder, well, what's the benefit of having a little bit thicker, like behind your forehead brain? 
the big benefit is that that part of the brain is what is controlling or what is managing what we call executive function, meaning our ability to moment to moment monitor what am I thinking right now? What am I saying? And what am I doing? So it basically puts us back into control of our life. And that I think is the most important benefit coming from the practice. So that was the first answer. Know the benefits because that motivates a lot of people. But then there are a few tips on how then to do the practice because sometimes just knowing the benefits is not going to be enough. So we can talk a bit about that if you want to. Oh, yes, please. Well, yeah, I, I want to hit the tips. And if okay, I can just get a little bit. All right. So can you give me some particulars about better sleep and more effectiveness? Because that was what I find compelling about those. I'm just such a numbers dork is just like, all right, Pete, this is ROI stuff. If I gain more minutes than I invest, then I am just a fool for not putting in those minutes because it's like getting free resources, like someone dumping a bag of money into my lap. So can I hear about the sleep and the effectiveness? Absolutely. So I can give you a few different numbers here. On average, the people that we work with, and we've worked with around 300,000 people so far from different companies, on average, they get a sleep quality that is in their own experience, 36% better. That means they fall faster asleep, they wake up fewer times, and they get into deeper sleep. So that's pretty significant. In terms of effectiveness, Depending on how you define effectiveness, there are a few factors of that. That is the ability to stay focused on task. There's the ability of prioritizing the right thing. And then there is the ability of having the awareness of reprioritizing when you need to. And out of those factors, again, our clients have average increase of 40%. So it's pretty significant. Then you may think, oh, Rathmus, he's just, you know, touting his own horn and all that. But other study done by Harvard and Stanford are coming to more or less the same numbers. So this is quite impressive. Now let's get into the, the how to. If we want to start training the mind, how do we get that going? Yeah, very good. So a few things that you can do if you want to actually adopt the practice is, first of all, like the, the hygiene stuff. Make sure you have a place that you do it. Make sure you decide for yourself what time of day. Make sure you decide how long time you want to do it. And a few tips that works best for most people is 10 minutes a day in the morning and the place, whatever place in your house that is most conducive, so most quiet. And there are no perfect places. That's like the hygiene factors. When you have that, you create a habit of coming back to the same place and it gets a little bit easier. Then the second thing is to just uh, puncture the biggest illusion that people have around mindfulness practice, which is the illusion that I'm going to practice mindfulness so that my mind will be calm and serene and beautiful, and I will never, ever be distracted or unhappy again. That is more or less the unconscious uh, idea that many of us have around this practice. And that is such a mistake because the human brain is wired for distraction. It is basically through evolution made to look out for movements and changes in environment to save us from a saber-toothed tiger that's about to attack us. So that means we are distracted all the time. If we see that as a failure, because we believe that we should be serene and clear and calm, we're going to feel so discouraged because we're going to feel like we're failures. So first of all, just letting go of that illusion. It is called mindfulness practice not mindfulness perfect because it's a practice and it's something we do again and again and again, and then we become a little bit better, but we never get the serene mind. Second one, bring some joy and pleasure into the practice. Many people find it or think that now I'm sitting and I have to focus and like their eyebrows go together and their face is frowning a little bit because it's serious business. Now I have to focus. Let go of all of that. I mean, seriously, the rest of the day, people are busy and running around and attention all over. These are the 10 minutes you give yourself every day to give yourself a break and just enjoy it. Just enjoy sitting with that breathing. How wonderful it is to sit and breathe. And the last one, really short, it is not a failure to drop off one day. It is only a failure if you then do it the second day. So it's okay not to do it every day. But if you decide you want to do it like 14 days in a row, if you drop off one day, no problem. Don't judge yourself. Just remember the next day, get back on the horse again.
So you're taking 10 minutes in the quiet place in the morning, and you're acknowledging that your mind is not going to be calm, serene, beautiful. And you're focusing on the breath. Like, what are you doing? You're sitting there thinking about the breath laid out for us. Yes, it's actually quite simple. Having said that, it never feels so simple when we get started on the practice. But first of all, it's important to relax. So relax your body and allow your mind to calm down a little bit. Because when we relax the body and we relax the mind a little bit, it's much easier to stay focused. When we're tense, which all of us are, then it's harder. So spend a few minutes, the first two minutes, just relaxing, especially as you breathe out, just releasing and letting go. Then start to bring your attention to the breath and let the breath become the anchor or the weight that you're lifting in this practice. Just like you go to the gym, you take a weight and you lift it up and you let go, you lift it up and you let it go. That's what you do with the breath. You're basically holding your attention on the breath as you're breathing in and breathing out and breathing in and breathing out and just sitting and doing that. And then at some point you'll realize, hey, now I'm thinking about what to cook for supper tonight. And that is a success. I mean, that's the moment where people feel they fail because, oh, now I got distracted again. But that moment is actually not where people got distracted because the distraction has been going on for a while. When they become aware, that is the moment that they're actually mindful again. Hey, I'm distracted. So that's a moment of celebration. We should be grateful to the distractions because they're basically telling us, hey, pal, you're off track. Get back to the breath again. So we're sitting, focusing on the breath. Then we realize we're distracted. Then we just gently guide our attention back to the breath again. That is, in essence, what we're doing in mindfulness practice. And then you may wonder, why should I do this? Yeah, I get, you know, I get a little bit better sleep and all that stuff. But the key here is the rest of the day in our lives, our attention is our most scarce resource. So many things are calling for our attention. And by training our focus, we are more able to pay attention to what we need to. And then when in daily life, we're sitting in a meeting or doing an email and we're getting distracted by notifications or people talking or just our own ruminating mind, we have the awareness that we also trained in mindfulness that helps us to come back again. So this skill of training focus and awareness helps us basically to be more effective at work, to be higher performing, to spend less time on doing more work. That's in essence what it is. I'm curious, are there additional practices when it comes to building resilience and, and our ability to cope with these difficult times beyond sitting and breathing that you would recommend? There are definitely a few things that are helpful and some of them are obvious. Just to cover off the basics, sleep is by far the most important for our well-being. So make sure you get enough sleep. But that's just, we all know that getting a little bit of movement is helpful and get good food is helpful. But we all know that. One thing that not everybody knows is if we want to have a little happier mind, feel a little bit more present, feel a little bit more balanced, multitasking is the enemy of all of that. So stopping to multitask, and that's a whole chapter on itself that we can talk about. But multitasking is the mother to all evil when it comes to performance, well-being, connections with others, and you name it. So sleep, movement, food, I often hear hydration, you know, mentioned in that same sort of a sentence. Do you have any thoughts on water consumption? That's very important. Of course, that's very important. That's a short answer. Oh, sure. Okay. Well, I guess some people say, you know, when I drink water, when I'm thirsty, and that's all, do I have to think about this any more than that? And some people say, absolutely, you do. If you're thirsty, it's too late. So yeah, where, where do you come out on hydration? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely true. If we're thirsty, then it is a little bit too late. Most people are probably better at drinking enough than they are at eating the right stuff. Especially those of us that are working in offices and long, working long days have the tendency of like after lunch and we have the dip in energy to, to stuff up with sugar, which is bringing us into the blood sugar roller coaster, which is very unhelpful for our brain's ability to function very well. So at least with the thousands of clients we work with, what we eat is more important than what we drink, unless if people are binging on energy drinks, which is also not a good thing. Now, I was reading your recent piece in the Harvard Business Review, Build Your Resilience in the Face of a Crisis, and there's just so much good stuff in there. I want to dig into some more details. 
So could you tell us the science behind how constant bad news puts our minds in a natural place where we get distracted? What's the mechanism or how does that unfold there? Yeah, that's a great question and something that probably most people experience right now. So when we come under stress, when we basically become anxious, the fight flight part of the brain, which is a very old part of the brain, kicks in. And we basically start to look for all the threat. We start to look for all the changes in the environment. And that in itself makes us incredibly distracted. So that's why we check the news more often. That's why we are binging on social media. And yeah, that's how the brain works. And then I also love to get your view if we go right into the heat of battle in terms of, all right, so here I am, I'm trying to get some work done. And I think, huh, I haven't checked the news yet. I wonder what's on there. So there I am. I'm there. I'm tempted. What do I do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you do? I think in that moment, it might actually be too late. And it's like we need to train ourselves a little bit before we get into battle. That's how all warriors or experts become good at what they do. It's not happening overnight. So again, it comes back to training the executive function on our brain so that we are more in control of what we do when we are in the heat of the moment. So my first answer would be practice mindfulness because that's going to help. Then now come to your situation. You are in that moment and you are tempted to go and check the news. Adopting a mantra of trying to have more space than more clutter is a really helpful one because we all tend to fill clutter into our mind. And then you may ask, why is it that we want to clutter our mind? And let me tell you a story about one of the most fascinating research projects that I have ever come across. And I'm a researcher myself, so I know a lot of research. So imagine this. You have a room. In that room, there's a chair. There's a table. There is a little machine with a button on it. And then there is a wire from that button that goes to a wristband that is put around your wrist. Then researchers put people into that room one by one. They put this wristband around their wrist and they say, now try to press the button. And then they basically get an electroshock on their wrist. And they're asked, is this painful? And people are like shouting and screaming and saying, yes, it is very painful. And they're asked, so how much would you pay to not have that pain again? And the people that have been doing through this research, and it's many hundreds, are saying that on average, they would give $47 to not have that electric shock again. Researchers say, fine, that's good, I understand. Now what we'll do is we'll leave you in, in this room just for yourself. Between 7 and 14 minutes, you'll be sitting in here. Are you okay with that? People say, yes, I'm okay with that. Sure, why not? And so people are sitting in a room where there's no TV, there's no phone, there's nothing they can do, nothing to look at, there are no windows, just left to their own device and a button whereby they can give themselves an electroshock that they would pay $47 not to have. What do you think they do? Well, you know, I've heard references to this, but the $47 was due to me. I think a surprisingly large proportion of us, just to escape boredom or whatever, choose to self-inflict, right? Now, what's the figure? Yeah, so the figure is for women is 46%. So that's a lot, like almost half of women. For men, it's 76 and even one of the guys in the experiment, he did it 117 times. So basically, the pain of being left to our own mind can be so horrible and scary for most of us that we would rather bring electroshock to ourselves than just be in our own mind. And so coming back to your example of you're going to do an interview and then, oh, should I just check the news? Our mind wants to check the news because our mind does not want space. Our mind wants clutter because when we have clutter, we don't need to think about the bigger existential questions like who am I and why does life sometimes feel painful? No, we rather drink a beer or we rather have a piece of chocolate or watch the news or do anything that avoids us thinking. So that's the answer. 